But, so, you know, I've got passion in a number of areas of hockey, and, and one of them is, is certainly the Toronto Maple Leafs. And in doing my research, I came upon uh, this particular team. So thank you for the opportunity to, to share a little bit of, of my passion on a long forgotten and, and a very dusty old team, a junior team in the Ontario Hockey Association called Toronto Young Rangers. So you think about uh, Toronto as a hockey city, and uh, we think about uh, them being an amazing hockey city. It's, my, it's not my hometown, but certainly my adopted town as well. And, uh, and Toronto is an amazing hockey city, but it's a Maple Leaf city. When you think about it, you know, the, uh, the Marlboros, the, the, sorry, the Marlies rather, they do modestly well, and uh, certainly during the playoffs they do so much better. Junior franchises have come and gone through the years, certainly we've lost the uh, St. Michael's Majors the last little while, the Brampton Battalion, uh, the Mississauga Ice Dogs. But in the glory days of junior hockey, and I'm talking about certainly in the 30s and 40s, and maybe verging on the uh, 50s, absolutely, the St. Michael's Majors, the, the Toronto Marlboros, and, and let's expand the GTA a little bit and include the Oshawa Generals in there as well. It was an outstanding junior hockey city as well. But during that same era, there were a couple teams that I mentioned, Dusty and Long Forgotten, and one of those was the Toronto Young Rangers. Um, an interesting team, no doubt about it. Why would I care? I, I love the underdog. And uh, there were a lot of connections to the Toronto Maple Leafs. And it led me to think that maybe there was a connection, uh, rather than just a dotted line connection, there was a, a connection with the Toronto Maple Leafs, which in fact, there, there is a bit of a connection as we went along. But why should we care? Well, it's a good question. I mean, you think about it, they suspended operations twice, folded after 17 seasons, never had a, a championship season at all. The best they ever did was a second place finish in their first season. Uh, finished last twice, virtually last a number of other times beyond that. And, uh, and yet, through that entire time, they existed beyond belief for 17 seasons. They sent 21 players to the National Hockey League, and they have uh, two Hall of Famers who are part of their alumni as well. So I want to talk a little bit about this uh, Toronto Young Rangers team, mostly because the dedication of one man, and a gentleman named Ed Wildy. Wildy was born in 1875 in Toronto, and his, uh, his passion, you think, would be hockey, but in fact, it was not exactly that. In fact, uh, he came to hockey a little bit later on. Um, at the age of 25, he was a boxer in Toronto. Three professional bouts, one, two, lost, uh, one to a draw, one by KO. Uh, thought that might move along, but they said that he was too gentlemanly. So in fact, his uh, boxing career kind of came to a close. But he was a big, heavy set gentleman, especially more as time went on as well. Um, he was tied to the Parkdale area of Toronto. So that'll ring in through a number of areas. He lived on a street called Sheridan, which is just on the edge of Parkdale, the Queen and Dufferin area, for those who know Toronto a little bit by any means. And uh, while he was there, he, his occupation was a tire repairer. So in fact, he worked for a, a, a mechanics office. Didn't have a great deal of money. He was blue collar through and through, but he, uh, he was quite a sportsman. Heavily involved in the Parkdale Canoe Club, and uh, which is also a, a legendary sort of place. Uh, the Parkdale Canoe Club was primarily in existence for, well, obviously rowing. And in fact, Wildey was quite a rower as well. But during the summer seasons, they also had, had football, they had a number of sports that went on. To keep their rowers in shape, they had a hockey team, the Parkdale Canoe Club, that we know so well. Those who know Toronto geography even a little bit will realize that, in fact, this this edifice now is on land. They, they filled in the uh, lakefront of Toronto, and so this is now the Boulevard Club in the very tony area of, uh, of the shores of Lake Ontario. But this is the very modest Parkdale Canoe Club back in 1911. So Ed Wiley was involved with the Parkdale Canoe Club at the time, and he decided that, in fact, he was involved with the Parkdale Canoe Club Hockey Club towards the latter part of, of the uh, 20s, decided he was going to put together his very own team. He got some investors as well, and in September of 1927, there was a very, very small piece in the Toronto Daily Star saying that there would be tryouts for a new team run by Uncle Ed Wildey 
that would uh, be playing in the junior loop of the Ontario Hockey Association that particular season. The Tridents were in a rink called the Ravina Rink, which is just a, it's now gone, long gone, was right beside Humberside Collegiate. Again, referencing all these Toronto things, just for those who may know a little bit of it. But in what was then known as, as uh, West Toronto. And they had tryouts there, but one of the things that uh, the canny Wildy did was he was able to steal or at least to convince a couple of players from the Parkdale Canoe Club, a very successful junior club, to come and join his team. He had a gentleman named Vern Ayers, um, he had a guy named Doug Smilly, he also had a, a young forward named Gaston Noam, and uh, there was quite a controversy over who actually owned his rights, and actually Wildy won that particular fight against the Parkdale Canoe Club all of a sudden uh, integrating a rivalry that had never existed before, but basically because of the fight over this one young center. Most of the other players came from, the, uh, from just playing around in the high school leagues in the city at the time. Later on, they would come from the Mercantile Hockey League that existed in Toronto at the time as well. They had bird dogs, as all the teams did, so Wiley didn't have a great budget, in fact he had no budget at all, but he would have friends and friends of friends who would alert him to good players and he would convince them to come to the Toronto, excuse me, Toronto Young Rangers. Now you have to remember that in the hierarchy of junior in the Toronto area at the time, the Toronto Marlboros were the club, there's no doubt about that one. The Toronto Young Rangers were basically in existence that if you couldn't make the team, but you still were pretty good at playing hockey, you might get a chance to play with the Toronto Young Rangers. So even though they played in the same league, there was a vast difference in the uh, abilities of most of the players. The, uh, the team played in the earliest days, although they practiced at the Sorbina Gardens, they played at the old arena gardens, quite often known as the Mutual Street Arena. They played there in their earliest days and later on found a home at uh, Maple Leaf Gardens. So the very first game, Actually, let me step back for a second. Uh, the very first season, I guess I should say, uh, Wildy wasn't on his own, a modest man of modest means. He did have some investors. A couple of names that maybe ring a little bit true for some of you. Uh, a gentleman named Waldo Holden was the sales manager of CFRB Radio. Uh, but the other name, a little bit more well known, is Doug Laurie, who later on had the sporting good, exactly the uh, athletic good store that had existed inside Maple Leaf Gardens that later on Tommy Smythe purchased from him. So they were investors in the team, heavily involved in the team as well. Very first game, excuse me, the very first game played against those arch-rival Parkdale Canoe Club boys, November 20th, 1928, a 3-2 victory for the Toronto Young Rangers in their very first game. Wildly, as you can see, you can probably read some of you can, but Wildly, the heavy set gentleman that I mentioned there, Doug Laurie in the back row on the far side, in his, uh, his business suit as well. So Wiley, coming from various areas of sports, was a very interesting man, and, uh, and he didn't think the way that all hockey uh, people thought, which was very great because it brought some innovation to the game that, uh, that hadn't existed before. One area that uh, has been talked about a great deal is pulling the goalie. Not a metaphor. Um, the, uh, the most well-known, I guess, is Art Ross doing it in 1933. But in fact, Ed Wildey had uh, performed the same stunt several years before. There's been a whole lot of discussion about this whole this practice. On February 5th, 1929, the Toronto Daily Star wrote, Young Rangers did a Frank Merriwell stunt last night in their game with West Toronto. Being one goal down and only four minutes to go, the Rangers manager, Ed Wildey, pulled his goalkeeper off the ice, inserted a forward in his place, and sent the entire six men up on the attack. This proved successful, Hickey batting the puck past Geddes for the tying score. At this stage, the Rangers put the goalkeeper back on the ice and he finished the game in net. The play was protested by the West Toronto team, who claimed under the rules that he could not re-enter the game until the end of the period. With this argument on, the teams and officials forgot that overtime wasn't even necessary as it was home, excuse me, as it was home and home games and the teams played 20 minutes of overtime but failed to break the deadlock to a moot point. So there we are, 1928, the first time that I can find any way of the strategy of pulling the goaltender. Stars on the team that year who went on to the National Hockey League, Don Smilly, I mentioned Doug earlier, I'm so sorry, Don Smilly, and Vernier, who I mentioned as well. 
that year, best year that the Young Rangers ever had. 17 seasons in existence, they finish in second place. They end up beating West Toronto, Owen Sound, Oshawa, but then they lost to that powerhouse team, the Toronto Marlboros, who had, at the time, they had Alex Levinsky, Charlie Conacher, Busher Jackson, went on to win the Memorial Cup as well. They played one more season and fell out of the playoffs, and then they suspended operations. They just ran out of money. People like uh, Lori and, and uh, Holden, who I mentioned before as investors, were no longer with the team. It's now left to this, <laughs> this poor um, mechanic who was trying to, uh, to carry on the team, couldn't dice a team again, and they had to suspend their operations. 1933-34, they come back again. Now this time, of course, they've gone to, uh, from the Arena Gardens to Madison, to Madison Square Hill, to Maple Leaf Gardens. And he's got an arrangement with Con Smythe. Wildey was well known and quite respected, although looked at as an also ran, kind of an orphan, as it were, in the uh, junior ranks. But he and Smythe were fairly friendly because they had uh, run in the same circles for a great long time. So Wildey was able to convince Con Smythe to allow him to use Madison why do I keep saying that? Sorry, Maple Leaf Gardens as their home squad, as their home team. That's their home arena is what I'm saying, sorry. But of course he got no benefits. Uh, what he had to negotiate, Smythe in fact took most of the proceeds from the gate, which were minimal at the best of times. In fact, it was quite laughable in the, uh, in the newspapers that often said that there were more ushers than there were fans in the stands at that time. So Smythe got most of the door. Um, but he allowed uh, Wildey to use it as his home arena, and he gave him an old uh, storeroom as a dressing room, and that's what the boys worked with. And that was uh, one of the crazy things, but it kind of identifies this Toronto Young Rangers team. You had to want to play hockey really badly to be on those teams, said Punch Up Imlac, an alumnus of the Young Rangers. We drilled as long as Bill James at Maple Leaf Gardens would let us stay on the ice. Our only rewards were for, excuse me, for playing with the Young Rangers were a malted milkshake, a dose of cod liver oil, malt and honey, and two streetcar tickets, and only the really needy received the car fare. <laughs> Players were given two sticks a year. If they needed more, they had to supply their own. So if there was a broken stick, in fact, Wiley would take the, the tape off the stick, save the tape, and use it on those that were merely cracked. <laughs> According to Punch and Lack's book, Hockey is a Battle, compared to the equipment of the Marlboros or West Toronto had over on the other side of the gardens, what we got was just tragic. Con Smythe also gave them the best times to practice. Their practices were 5.30 until 7 o'clock every weekday morning. Um, but Wildey was still a very, very savvy coach. He was coach, owner, manager, everything else as well. And he was able to put together competitive teams year after year. Not competitive enough to play in the elite side of things, but certainly to, to play in the league. His big thing was clean living, uh, physical fitness, and hard work, and they were the keys to success. Because he was a boxer in the early days, in fact, in the dressing room, he had a heavy bag and he, he tried to entice the guys to, to uh, use it to, to work on their fighting acumen. He also would do three round bouts with some of his players. They weren't allowed to hit above the shoulders, but they were allowed to hit in the solar plexus right there in the dressing room. So, one of those things. Ed taught his players to play the game cleanly, but to the hill, both on and off the ice. If they broke his no smoking or drinking rule, they were off the team, added him like. He also had a similar rule. Uh, by this time, uh, Ed Wiley had four young daughters who were quite attractive. There was no dating of Edith, Violet, Dorothy, or Beatrice. <laughs> so they're back in the league, 1934-35, and they've got some, uh, some good players on the team by this point as well. And one of the players that we certainly know a great deal about is, is uh, a gentleman by the name of Gordy Drillen. Drillen had come up from Moncton. How he came by way of Moncton to the Young Rangers, we don't know. Was it one of the bird dogs? Had Gordy come to town to play with the Marlboros? Yeah. yeah. I think uh, what happened was he was a left-handed softball pitcher. And, uh, you know, those are pretty... And I think he actually went there to play softball. But he was imported as a, as a softball pitcher and somebody got wind and saw him. He was pretty good. Oh, he too. certainly was very good. He ended up being the the leading scorer on the team, both in goals and points that particular time. But just like so uh, happened so often with the Young Rangers, Wiley couldn't keep him on the team. He was with the team but for the one season, and then he went off to the Toronto Lions, another junior club, who lured him away with a little bit more money, a little bit more, although it was under the table, a little bit more uh, access to, to play and, and all of those sorts of things too. This is a common trait that happened with players on the Young Rangers. They were often stolen away very quickly by teams who, who 
pluck the better uh, better players. You see the Oshawa Generals and the Toronto Marlboros quite often stocked with young Rangers alumni for that exact reason. Also on that team, well, actually let me just stick with this one for a second. Finding a jersey for the young Rangers is quite rare. The Hockey Hall of Fame has got one. It's a, it's a very small version and it looks like it might have been worn at one point, but it was uh, shrunk. It's hard to tell if it was an actual sweater or not. We believe that they're black and white horizontal stripes, although there was some question last night about maybe the fact that they were dark purple as well, but we believe them to be black and white stripes with Young and Rangers coming to a point on the uh, chest of the sweater too. Only a couple of shots that I've seen, but this is one that you can kind of see in this picture of Gordy Drillman at the time. Also on that team that year, Jimmy Fowler went on to play with the Leafs and George Parsons. Interesting story about Parsons is that uh, we talked about innovation with uh, Ed Wildey. Wildey went to the, uh, to the league, the junior uh, loop of the Ontario Hockey Association, and wanted to see if he could put a benevolent fund together for players who could use the money, whether they be because of injury or because their family was not of means. And uh, he, he put together a proposal that alumni from the Young Rangers, who at that point would only be a handful of years old, uh, would play against the alumni of other junior teams to try and raise money to put in, a, in an account. They all laughed at him and thought that was the most ridiculous idea. A couple of years later, Parsons lost his eye, although not with uh, the Young Rangers when he was playing with the Leafs. And, uh, and in fact, such a, a fund was created at, at that time in both the National Hockey League and the OHA. So the team was just uh, horrendous for a number of years. They, they continued on that particular year. They, they had a, a decent year. They went to the playoffs and uh, they finished second actually and went to the playoffs and lost out in the semifinals. But from there, there was an actual slide that continued on. The next year, a few other players went on to the National Hockey League. George Brigger, Red Hamill, Reese Thompson as well. So this is part of the legacy of what uh, the Young Rangers were all about. It's not about their successes as a team, but more as the players who uh, played with the team. The name that came up just moments ago, Charlie Phillips wearing a Young Rangers jersey. We were talking about him just uh, a few moments ago with some of the folks here. Okay, here's a guy who uh, we've heard of as well. George Imlach was his name at that particular time. So George Imlach was a, a star player with Northern Vocational High School and was recruited by Wildey to play with the Young Rangers. He wasn't allowed to play the first year because he was only 15 years old and, and under the, uh, the rules at the time, or at least the, the regulations, he had to be 16 or over. So he just uh, practiced with the team and, and uh, worked out with them and made the team 1935-36. In fact, it was quite unusual that he was with the team for three years. There's a reason for that. I, I think one of them is incredible loyalty for Ed Wildey, but uh, Imlach was, uh, was really kind of learning from uh, Wildey, and he'll talk about a little bit more about his practices a little bit later on, but it's quite a, a great story about, uh, about Punch Imlach. Uh, by the way, his nickname, Punch, didn't happen at the, uh, at the junior level. It came a couple of years later when he was playing senior hockey down in Windsor, and he, uh, he was cold cocked and out when he came to. He started to hit the trainer, and they called him Punchy after that, and the name got shortened down to Punch. Other players who we would know, one of the National Hockey League, Murray Henderson, he's part of the Conacher clan, quite a, a legendary clan there. He's the uh, son of oldest, oldest daughter, I guess, of the, uh, the 10 Conacher kids. Uh, she went by the name of Dolly, but his uncle, Lionel, Charlie, Roy, Burt didn't make the National Hockey League. He lost his eye with a, a Charlie Conacher stick in a road hockey game, but we just lost him a week or so ago. His cousins were, uh, were uh, um, Brian Conacher, of course, and, and uh, Charlie's son as well, who played in the National Hockey League. And, and uh, an interesting kind of sideline that uh, plays to his side is, is uh, Lionel's wife. The sister of Lionel's wife was married to Harold Baldy Cotton, who ended up being a, a, a school he played for the Leafs as well, but was a scout in the National Hockey League with Boston for a long time. And he hired Murray, or they called him Mo at the time, to a contract in the National Hockey League. Different players went on to play in the National Hockey League as well. Jimmy Conacher, who is not part of the Conacher clan, but certainly was a star on that team at the time. And here's a, a great story too, a gentleman named Herb Carnegie, who arguably was the greatest player never to play in the National Hockey League. There's quite a story there that all goes down to the Young Rangers as well. 
During a morning practice at Maple Leaf Gardens, Ed Wiley called Connor Carnegie over to the board and said, you see that guy up there? You've heard the story before as well. See that guy over there? He said he'd pay anybody. And of course, it was a terrible reaction. My immediate reaction was disbelief for Carnegie and his memoirs, A Fly and A Pale of Milk. How could I accept that my dreams and the game that I loved so much were now over? And yet, there was an awareness that it could be true. I can't remember exactly what I thought, but a little voice in the back of my head was kissing my NHL hopes goodbye. It's a horrible feeling to realize that opportunity has been snatched from your hand unfairly by such dastardly means. The last opportunity would never return, and the flame of my NHL dream, while still burning strongly, was slowly extinguished over the years. What in hell did color have to do with putting the puck in the net? To find that the owner of the team I loved and had cheered for all those years would not accept me because of my skin color hurt beyond compare, and it still does. There was nothing I could do and just because I was colored. So did it actually happen? Well, we believe it to be true, and it's, it's third, fourth, 80th, uh, 80th person now, but uh, one of the people who was around at the time was a referee read story. There's a reason why Herb Carnegie did not play in the NHL, and it's very simple, he said. He's black. I'm not saying Con Smythe was bigoted. Basically, Con Smythe was a good guy away from the arena. I think he said what he said, but I think he meant that with Herbie being black, he wouldn't be able to put him in the same hotels with the rest of the team and have him eat at the same restaurants, and there could be the problems if he took him to the stage to play against NHL teams there. The NHL games weren't sold out then, and the owners might have been worried about losing the fans they already had. Basically, you were blocked out of everything if you were black back then. And I think Con Smythe didn't want to take a chance on him. So he was saying, I'd take him if you could turn him white, but I still would have taken a chance on Herb Carnegie if I were Con Smythe. So, so was it a big thing to say? Certainly in today's lexicon it was. Um, it, it was the era, unfortunately, at the time. Uh, whether Red Story is right or whether it was simply a bigoted statement is so tough to say. But nevertheless, Herb Carnegie was playing with the Young Rangers. Played the one year, went on to a, a terrific career, including, uh, including uh, Quebec Senior Hockey League, and, and uh, made a wonderful career and a great story as well. One of those great stories that we should have chronicled on video at some point. Team continued on with players, went to the National Hockey League, but again, without particularly winning any, any uh, great renown. But Jackie Hamilton, Jack McLean, I'll be transparent here, but this is my uncle. Cliff Simpson. Another player who played a couple of years later, a guy named Bill Schill, played on with the Boston Bruins, but he was, a, he was the top scorer with the Young Rangers for a number of years as well. 1941-42 comes along, and, and after long and tortured times, trying to find some money to keep the, the team going, and it was a real struggle year after year after year, Ed Wildey finally finds a little bit of success. So you think about the teams that were enjoying some sponsorship at the time. So the Guelph Biltmore Hockey Club was certainly the Guelph Biltmore uh, Mad Hatters were sponsored by the Biltmore Hat Club or Hat uh, Company of uh, down in Guelph. We had uh, the Oshawa Generals with General Motors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Young Rangers weren't sponsored by anybody. They got no money. They got they got a thousand dollars if one of their players went to the National Hockey League. They got two hundred and fifty if another team were to pluck them off their team. Uh, they got a little bit from the gate that they had to share with Con Smythe as well. So there was really no money to be had. And, and this Ed Wildey, who again is a blue collar worker, he uh, lost money year after year after year, but did so out of the passion. But in 1941-42, he scores a great success. He finds a company who's willing to sponsor them for one year. And it was a place called Bowles Lunch. And it was a, a chain of, of lunch spots that, uh, that featured something they called the quick lunch. They just had chairs lined up all along. You would go up to a steam table and serve yourself and sit along the, uh, the side of the, the uh, restaurant and have yourself a lunch and get in and get out as quickly as you can. So there were three locations in Toronto at the time. There were also others in other cities too. But they became, for one year, Toronto Bulls Young Rangers. 1941-42 was the only season they were. Uh, Bulls didn't renew their, their uh, sponsorship the next year. The slide continued from there on. Maybe it explains why uh, the Young Rangers, sorry, the uh, Bulls uh, lunch didn't continue on with the Young Rangers beyond that. But they still had players, very good players, who, in spite of having to face all kinds of adversity, still were able to, uh, to emerge as National Hockey League players. Jelano was a goaltender, terrible, terrible goals against average with the Young Rangers, but you can't expect much more when you're, you're facing 60 and 70 shots went on to win the Calder Trophy as Rookie of the Year and had a, a modest NHL career as well. Also on the team that year, 
Ben and Dal Dewsbury went on to, uh, to play in the National Hockey League with a couple of teams. During the 1942-43 season, into February, Wildy suffers a heart attack behind the bench and uh, is, is hospitalized for a period of time. They found a guy named Shorty Rutledge, who happened to be the father of one of the players, who was going to fill in, but it was, it was all Wildy's show, and Rutledge gave up the ghost, and by a week or so later, the team folded and didn't even finish the season at that time. They withdrew for that particular season. They did come back the next season, though. Other, other players that went on to the National Hockey League is Harry Paderni, who had a cup of coffee with the Boston Bruins, and I think he's a one-game wonder, as I recall. But uh, the team didn't make the playoffs that year, nor did, they, nor did they the next year, with Hugh Bolton coming in to replace uh, the late Bill Barocco on defense for the Toronto Maple Leafs. So again, a good, strong player, but the team, the young Rangers, by this time were plummeting, and the descent continued over and over again. 46-47, they finished in last place in a 10-team league. Ron Hurst, who some of us know from the lunches that we uh, have been to with the alumni, played one game with the Young Rangers. But again, it's that sort of story that goes on and on. They would go through 35 or 40 players a season because you, you can only lose so much to be candid. And, and so they would go and they'd play or they'd quit. Or there'd be a trade to go to another team or they'd convince another team to pick up their, their uh, contract or whatever it happened to be. So. So the team is plummeting, they're on their last legs at this point. Another player, Stan Smirky, who played with the Montreal Canadiens as well. This time they finished last for the second year in a row. Their record, <coughs> excuse me, their record uh, an atrocious. Two wins, 30 losses, no ties, four points at this point. And they, uh, by the end of that season, they decide that they just can't go on. They've lost so much money. Ed Wildy, by this point, is pushing 70 years of age. Figures, you know, life is too short and I can't continue on. So for the 1948-49 season, it was a nine-team Ontario Hockey Association junior loop at that particular time. Wildy continued on, still was a great uh, fan of hockey, still uh, going to a number of the games, and one of his alumni, Punch Imak, who we uh, talked about a little bit earlier on, Punch, of course, went on to be the assistant general manager with the Leafs to begin with anyway, and later on took the... Uh, general manager's mantle as well. And Imlac would often call Wildy for, uh, for mentorship, to talk about various things. He would also suggest uh, players, Wildy would suggest players to Imlac as well. For example, one guy that Wildy was high on was a guy named Bill White. And uh, Bill White was a uh, tall, lanky defenseman, and, and, uh, and Wildy thought the world of him. Imlac and the team signed him, it wasn't Imlac so much, but uh, he was signed to the Leafs organization. But Wildy chastised him severely when uh, he traded, traded White to Springfield Indians, Eddie Shore's team, for, uh, in a package that went for Kent Douglas, and Wildy thought that was awful, you've lost out. I guess Wildy was ultimately right, because uh, White went on to, to a terrific career, all-star uh, career, that just started with Los Angeles and finished with Chicago by this point. On March 1st, 1961, more than 100 former uh, young Rangers and their friends honored Ed Wildy at a dinner held at the Conroy Hotel. Even the hotel has a, con uh, a Conacher connection. Uh, Con, Roy, Charlie Conacher, Roy Werners owned the hotel at the time, and it was uh, the place to be. Imlac spoke at the time, and he, uh, he stated, the leaf success is due in part to the training I had under Uncle Ed Wiley. Our system is much the same as the one used by the Young Rangers. Another gentleman who went on to, not to the National Hockey League, but a terrific business career with, with uh, Hershey Chocolate, a guy named Hap Ingram. Uh, he played for the uh, Young Rangers for a couple of seasons, and he said, We all owe Ed a great deal, not only for his unequal contribution to junior hockey, but his secret formula for building character. And really, I think that's the legacy that Ed Wildey had. Gordy Drillen couldn't make it, but he sent a telegram, and he said, Thinking tonight of the years back to May 1933, never realizing what was in store for me. A scoring championship, the last one for the Leafs, <laughs> all-star teams, Lady Big Trophy, and a Stanley Cup in the next few years, all made possible because of you. I want to thank you tonight, Ed, for those good years and your good health and for many more years. I've always said it takes a champion <laughs> to make a champion. So in 19, uh, 1962 now, um, the Ontario Hockey Association decides to award Ed Wildey the gold stick, which is given for meritorial, uh, meritorious rather, efforts in junior hockey, in minor hockey anyway, and uh, such, a, 
such uh, wonderful folks as Captain James T. Sutherland, W.A. Hewitt, Fred Waghorn, Hap Ames, Harold Ballard have all won the gold stick through the years. At the time, Lloyd Pollock was the president of the Ontario Hockey Association, and in doing the presentation, he had this to say. We have another presentation to make, but unfortunately, the recipient is not with us today. I refer to Ed Wiley of the Young Rangers of Toronto. I don't think Ed ever took credit for sending a lot of boys to the National Hockey League who became stars, but he was the guy who gave many of them their start with the Young Rangers. I remember particularly our first year in Junior A in Windsor, when a New Year's date with the Young Rangers and the weather conditions couldn't have been worse under any stretch of the imagination. There was snow, sleet and ice and hail, and I thought the Rangers couldn't possibly get down from Toronto, and I certainly understood if they couldn't, but they showed up a couple of hours before the game was scheduled to start, and we had one of the best crowds of the season in spite of the storm. I thought it was a wonderful thing. Perhaps his club wasn't going too far in our league, but he, he was giving some boys a chance to play hockey. He's not here today, but W.A. Hewitt said he would accept the gold stick on his behalf and see that he got it. So William A. Hewitt in the Hockey Hall of Fame and father of uh, Foster, grandfather of Bill, I guess we could continue on, had this to say. On behalf of Mr. Wiley, I wish to thank the OHA for this gold stick award. I tried to get him to come down. I pleaded with him over the phone yesterday, but he doesn't go out anymore. I got his wife and talked to her and finally got her to commit to coming down so that we could meet and make the presentation to him. But she called back last night and said, I've tried to persuade Ed to go down to the hotel for the meeting, but he doesn't go out anymore, I'm sorry, and he won't be able to attend. I said the OHA wanted to honor him by giving him one of our Gold Stick Awards. I'll be very glad to accept it on his behalf. So Mr. President and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to accept this Gold Stick Award on behalf of both Mr. and Mrs. Wiley. I thank you again because all the good things the President has said about Mr. Wiley are true. He had hundreds of kids skating and falling throughout the years, first at the old mutual rink, later at Maple Leaf Gardens. But he's not been around for some time, is not physically able to be present to here today. Just uh, about a year later on, we lost uh, Ed Wiley, he had a heart attack. Three weeks later, he, he passed away, and uh, July 18, 1964. Put that earlier. Passed away. But I guess, as I mentioned, his legacy is not only wonderful people, a wonderful teams that did gave a chance for some uh, some guys to play. It's the people that came out of it. They learned his dedication to the game. They learned about passion. They learned what it took to uh, to be a, a hockey player. In his uh, eulogy, he was an amazing man, recalled Punch and Lack. A lot of him rubbed off on me in the three years that I played junior hockey for him. A lot of things that I learned from him, his principles, I still believe in. Ed Wildey's attitude was that if you don't work, you don't accomplish. Finally, he said, Ed Wildey had this game figured out 30 years ago. So long forgotten to the annals of hockey history, uh, I thought I could bring it back a little bit and talk about a guy who was just one of the, the, the real hard workers out there that the game has built upon their shoulders, a guy named Ed Wildey and a long forgotten team called the Toronto Young Rangers. Thanks very much. Thank you. And if there are any questions or comments, queries, omissions, yes, sir. Well, there's two names I just want to ask you about. Uh, uh, Josh Eleno, he, he went to McGill University. Was, was that before he played for the Rangers or after? He, he was at McGill beforehand. He came from McGill to the Young Rangers. And then went to the ball. Yeah. Uh, Kent Douglas, he was a, a, a 67 uh, yeah, Kent Douglas didn't play for the Young Rangers. Sorry, the uh, the story there was strictly the fact that Bill White was was basically scouted by uh, Ed Wildey, and uh, Imlac picked him up for the organization, and Wildey chastised Imlac for trading him away to the Indians for Kent Douglas. Nothing more than that. Yeah. Any other? Yes, sir. Kevin, a fantastic presentation. I'm I'm curious to know uh, not so much about the content, but the process, because you're having to deal with a lot of relatively obscure information. How many hours, days do you think you put into the research and the development of your presentation? Started this morning at 10. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I'm a, a huge Leafs fan. And um, and through the years, have come upon this, this name so often. I mentioned a little bit that this Jack McLean is related to me. He's my, uh, my grandmother's brother. Excuse me, sorry, I could dry mouth today. So in looking up family history and looking up leaf history, I came across the Young Rangers often enough and just thought, what a peculiar team and what a great team to find out a little bit more about because, uh, candidly, I can't imagine anybody else would want to do a whole lot of research on the Young Rangers. But I just thought it was a story that needed to be told. So 
It was one of those things done over the course of several years that I've just been collecting for a little while and, and when the word came out to, uh, to do presentations, I thought, you know, that this is the right group and the right time to bring it forward. Thanks, Omni. Yes, sir. You mentioned that at the, at the start they were sort of organized out of the Ravina rink and in the late 20s there was also the Toronto Ravina's professional team. Was there any association between the Ravina's and the Rangers? No, nothing more than the fact they both shared the same rink. Uh, the Ravina rink was, was fairly, was widely used. In fact, that's where uh, where uh, Con Smythe held the New York Rangers training camp before the uh, the first year of the New York Rangers. It was just a, a great rink in the downtown core, uh, available. The Mercantile League ran out of there for years and years and years as well. Uh, it's nothing more than it was just shared rink, Kevin. Thanks. Yes, sir. The Ravina, what caliber of hockey or what league did they play in? The Ravinas were in the Canadian Professional League. Yeah. They were, they were the Canada League. They were mostly associated with the league. Yeah. And, um, Half day played there, uh, the Can Pro League anyway, but uh, I mean there were several Ravinas, that particular one that Kevin states uh, was a semi-pro team. Last thoughts or comments? Yes, sir. Just talk about the Rangers and being their uh, training camp. Uh, is there a link between the Rangers and the Young Rangers at any no, I thought so at first because sponsorship at the time, you know, the Toronto uh, Maple Leafs had St. Michael's Majors for all intents and purposes, and the Toronto Marlboros uh, at various times, Oshawa, Detroit, and Boston, and went on and on like that. So I just assumed, to begin with, and you make assumptions and then prove them wrong or prove them correct, but I assumed that they were sponsored by the New York Rangers, but there was no affiliation. I can't find out where the name came from. It may just have been a flight of fancy for Mr. Wildey, the Young Rangers. It may have had something to do uh, with uh, something that else had gone on in his life, whether it was a, a Boy Scout movement, I'm making this up, I have no idea, but there was nothing to do with the National Hockey League team. Last thought, comment? Yes, sir, at the back, yeah. Yeah. Sir. Kevin, uh, you mentioned a couple of other Toronto teams also in the OHA Junior League, like the Toronto Lions and maybe also the uh, Toronto Ravinas. Uh, so Native so yes, the accomplishment of Ed Wildey was to keep his organization going while these other teams would last about two years and then fall by the wayside. That's exactly true, Len, you're right. Again, you wonder how it could be done, because it certainly wasn't done with deep pockets by any means, and it was all passion. And it was a loyalty of the players to him as well, and, and they made it happen. And you're right, 17 seasons is, is extraordinary when you think of all these others that are, are by the side of the road along the way. It wasn't without its impediments, certainly, because they did uh, suspend operations twice and ultimately folded during a tough time. The players all went on to, to a lot of them went to the British Hockey League. Uh, some of them went down to the Pacific Coast. Post hockey league as well in the late 40s, but to uh, to exist in the junior league for 17 seasons is a testament almost exclusively to Ed Wiley. Why don't we let it go with that? All right. Thanks very much.